Uh, good evening, everybody, or good day, even, if you're uh, um, in America or in the US or whatever. Um, Patrick here, um, your host of the Philosophy Film Club. Um, today we're going to talk about Interstellar, and um, Interstellar was, oh, what a movie. Um, lots to say about it. Pretty, I watched it IMAX, and um, I must admit it was uh, pretty blown away by the whole movie. It was, uh, I guess it's that huge screen thing, you know, where you're just completely enveloped by it. And um, two and a half hour long. I mean, gosh, I don't think I've seen it two and a half hour long since um, since I think that Kevin Costner movie when he was, that <laughs> was it, Dancing with Wolves or whatever. I think that was uh, the last huge long movie I've seen. So, uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I had some some criticisms of it, mind. I mean, it's um, some uh, very abstract ideas going on it. I guess uh, it's really popular with the scientists, of course. I mean, um, I have seen a lot of the background about the science in it, of the movie, and um, so it does seem to have, unlike gravity, it does seem to have been using proper science. But that, all that is said and done, I mean, quantum mechanics isn't exactly easy for me to understand, although it, it gave me a lot of food for thought, and it actually caused me to go and look up a lot of this stuff and really try to understand it. But um, but anyway, I'm going to um, going to pass along because um, we've got a group of callers today, and uh, of course the, my co-host Aidy. Aidy is from Missouri, of course. Um, she is um, she is the host of her own um, website called RealTimeLifeCoaching.com, um, where you can get some uh, coaching from her. Anyway, Aidy, um, I'll hand it over to you. What was your um, what was your experience of the movie? Well, hello everybody, and it's so nice to see you all here, callers and uh, listeners. And um, yeah, I mean, um, I watched the movie in IMAX just like you did um, with a few friends. And um, this movie, um, you know, it's based on the ideas of uh, Keith Thorne, as far as I've read, who is a theoret theoretical physicist. Now, uh, he puts forward the notion that while uh, we observe the universe in uh, three dimensions, there could be at least five dimensions. Now, this story, the story of the movie, relies on the theory that uh, um, certain forces like gravity bleed through dimensions. This would mean that um, what we perceive as finite, as a finite calculation, could actually have infinite implications. Now, why am I saying this? Because this makes this uh, theory the wet dream of every Hollywood writer and director. And because of this, Interstellar, I think it's a, it's a film that gets to play around a lot with the unknown, while uh, at the same time, um, it gets to claim that it's, you know, science. Um, so as I said before, I saw it on IMAX, and if, like me, you enjoy getting lost in a movie and letting the visuals take you on a roller coaster like experience, then uh, Interstellar is totally worth your time and uh, your money. But, you know, if you are a nitpicker and if you like the storyline of your movies to, to make a lot of sense, if you have a more geeky nature and you find yourself often debating the science behind the fiction, then uh, the time travel paradox will drive you crazy. The, um, the unbreakable nature of the two-inch aluminum spaceship will cause you to face palm throughout the whole movie, and um, the ending will probably make you want to ask for your money back. But, you know, I abandoned all reason and uh, simply enjoyed the visual experience and the, the thrill that uh, this movie brought uh, on the screen and I allowed myself to get lost in this fantasy world for a few hours and uh, this, this, this was the only way that I was able to get my money's worth and walk out of the theater feeling uh, literally like I just smoked a huge bowl of weed. So uh, <laughs> that's my take on the movie, Pat. Yeah, I, I have to say, I mean, I, I really, we both spoke afterwards, didn't we, when we watched it, and um, yeah, it was pretty. I, I, I was, I really enjoyed it on that level, on a sort of surf, <clears throat> on a surface level sort of experience. It was really, yeah, it was really good. It was probably one of the few movies I've come out with going, kind of a little bit lost for words. Now I think I sort of have some reasons for being lost for words a bit um, <clears throat> after some thought about it but um but yeah no great I, I'm glad you enjoyed it anyway as much as I did and, uh, but um anyway I'm gonna um, pass on to Phil Phil's from Indiana he joined us of course on the afterports 
with the giver and also previous call about the pre previous sorry getting my words muddled up here my previous listeners call with uh, the giver as well so Phil take it away what was your uh, thoughts um I, I would have to second third everything that you guys had said about just how great it stands as a movie I mean I, I do feel like it's uh it stands just as good as Inception and other movies that Christopher Nolan's produced or directed I should say and there were some aspects of it that if you want to get very critical you're more than welcome to do so um, I go into a movie feeling as though it's a dream that I'm watching and so things don't necessarily have to make sense in their entirety in the real world but rather are they consistent within the movie um, early in the movie usually uh, there will be some guidelines that are set out and then how well do they tie in with what they lay out early, early on in the movie and um, and aside from that uh, there were definitely some aspects of uh, metaphor and theme that I thought you know are things that we'll get into later but uh, in particular the, the, the parent-child dynamic uh, so much of that is is obvious and conscious on the part of the directors and the writer uh, or the director and the writer and uh, and also too there there are some some mystical aspects to the uh, the wet dream that the AD was talking about uh, within the science of uh, the possibility of fifth dimensions uh, spoken by Kip Thorne and how they relate to the theme uh, has something to do with Murphy's law as it's stated in the movie uh, in the movie Murphy's law is that which can happen will happen and um, if it's as mystical as I'm afraid it, it could be then I, I would almost just as soon call it Smurfy's law um, that which can be smurfed will be smurfed and uh, and I and, and I, I greatly enjoyed the movie and I don't think that the, I, I think you can pull a lot of wonderful things out of the theme but if the theme ends up being an, like an appeal to the mystic uh, you know, within so much of society, then I do kind of feel like uh, Christopher Nolan might have smurfed this movie, and uh, I'm not I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> <Smurf>. <laughs> Great. Yeah, Philip, I I totally subscribe to your idea of watching the movie like it's a dream, and this is why I was uh, able to enjoy it in the moment. Uh, although later on, a few issues uh, came to my mind and started to bother me, but uh, I'm gonna uh, talk about those later. Let's uh, let's uh, uh, give Dumitru the mic and uh, Dumitru is reaching us from uh, all the way from Romania today and um, I was wondering what what was your take on the movie Dumi? Um, I, was, I was captivated by it, it was the, on, on two different uh, levels I think I like the techie part of it like the time travel and, uh, and I, I especially loved how powerful the, the, the scene was when they crashed into that water planet and and somebody said, well, on this planet, the, the previous explorer just crashed here just hours ago. So it's not like it hasn't been 20 years. But when they get back up to their ship, it's been like 23 years. And anyways, this is just, just one example of stuff like that that may really um, draws a very nice picture of relativity and really clearly um, shows some of the effects. I thought that was pretty cool. But that's the one side. Uh, but the, and the other side that I thought, uh, what's really cool is the more philosophical part is when, uh, for example, Matthew McConaughey is, is the, 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 he played really well. The, the, the desperation that you could feel in his voice that he's unable to get his daughter to make his younger self stay. You know, he, he sent her that message, that stay message. Just the pain in his voice and in his feeling of, of, of the inability to get himself to not leave his daughter, and that was uh, that was very touching for me, and uh, kind of drives home a point. But uh, it, it, at the same time, it, it, I was a little bit um, in a way I was kind of expecting, but I was um, a little bit disappointed that um, the the message of the movie is that you know they the message is that you have to go and save the world because nobody else can, you know, like that. That's a little bit silly, but it's uh, it's quite frequently encountered. Um, and little other odds and ends and little, little aspects of it that I thought were pretty cool. Um, 
but those are those are the two main main points that kind of stuck with me. Great, great. The the background story of the uh, uh, of the personal relationships of of how it affects and the and the regrets that he has about things that he's done in his past, and and I think that could be a a good message to take to heart for people who will because none of us will have the ability to go back in time and and correct ourselves. Right, the time to make a change is now, and this this really kind of paints a very powerful picture of yeah. That's an interesting Absolutely. aspect. I'd not not really um, I'd not really clicked with that. But now, when when you talk about it, it's an interesting part about it. Yeah, thanks, mate. Um, okay, I'm going to go to Motec Man. Now, Motec Man is in the Midwest in the U.S. And uh, Motec Man, go for it. What's what was your uh, what were your thoughts on the movie overall? Well, man, that was an awesome movie. I, I know that term is overused a lot, but man, it really was a very immersive because I saw it in IMAX as well and it was an awesome movie and I, I got swept away by it, especially near the end. I did notice a lot of inconsistencies or I maybe I should put it as gaps in the storyline as I saw it. Uh, things that just didn't seem to flow well in terms of the overall uh, prog progression of the movie, but uh, it was extremely, uh, I was thoroughly thrilled and enjoy, enjoyed the movie a great deal by the movie, and and uh, as we get into the discussion of uh, each element, each little aspect of it, I think I could probably contribute more, but bottom line is I, I, uh, I, I enjoyed it very much. Okay, well, uh, just uh, for um, uh, to share with the listeners uh, a little bit of information, Motec and I saw the movie together in IMAX since we are really close to each other here in uh, in the Midwest, and um, we got to talk quite a lot after after we got out of the theater. And I'm really looking forward, especially hearing what you have to say about the the scene inside the. Um, the black hole, but let's not dwell on this too much and let's go to our next caller. Um, let's take Matt. Matt is reaching us from Arizona and um, where did you see the movie and, and uh, how do you feel about it? Hi, Adi. Um, I saw this movie in IMAX as well and I thought it was wonderful. I'm a huge sucker for good science fiction, um, so I kind of expected to go in liking it, but um, and while I noticed the few scientific inconsistencies here and there, um, towards the end especially, I really was, I really felt connected emotionally with a lot of the characters, and um, it was a really powerful film, I felt. That covered a lot. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, we have another caller, Rahul. Now, Rahul is from Georgia, is it, I believe? Um, Rahul, what was your, uh, where did you see the movie and how did you feel about it? Uh, I unfortunately did not see it in IMAX. I saw it uh, in a regular theater, not 3D or anything. But uh, one of the things that I do when I normally see a movie is I really try to bond with the characters. So uh, in doing that, uh, especially uh, given the context of, you know, um, I have a kind of a background in philosophy and psychology. Uh, I really try to immerse myself and try to uh, find, you know, the humanness in all the characters. Uh, a scene that particularly stood out to me was when um, that one astronaut that they had found uh, betrayed them all, and he tried to leave with their spaceship, even though he couldn't dock. And I was just trying to. Uh, I, that whole scene uh, left me kind of blown away. Just because of the magnitude of you know uh, you know the amazingness of uh, the main character, uh, he was uh, he was able to dock it properly despite the fact that the uh, spaceship had been destroyed. But um, I was also thinking about just how uh, how the astronaut that betrayed them, how his uh, his panic and desperation and uh, survival instincts had just gone to the point where it was just you know you know <laughs> doesn't matter I'm getting out of here you know. Um, that that's what uh, that's probably the uh, one scene that uh, really kind of left an impression on me. Um, other parts of it were how um, uh, uh, the father, the main character, he was able to leave uh, Murphy or Murph, uh, and um, I don't know that that scene. Uh, it just kind of bothered me a lot because um, it seemed like he was like a really good father, like he. Uh, he would involve them in uh, his things like 
uh, drone hunting and his hobbies, and he would encourage them to, you know, do whatever they felt was good. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, it's like um, he, he was put in a really difficult uh, position uh, based on what Earth needed and all that from him. But uh, I don't know. It's, uh, we can discuss that later. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I thought uh, that uh, the movie was just, you know, absolutely phenomenal. Um, I'd go watch it again. Yeah, thanks, Sohel. Um, you kind of stole my thunder a little bit, but no problem, because um, <laughs> I was actually going to talk about... It was Cooper, I think, who's the main character. Right. And, um, yeah, I was um, I was very intrigued by his by some of the... Uh, uh, he was kind of ambiguous a little bit as a father, right? I mean, on the one, on the one hand, like you say, he had this kind of uh, character that was sort of um, interested in his children, um, interested in the kind of... Um, uh, the um, their their education, their knowledge, their just uh, their happiness, seemingly, and all of that. And um, but there was this other part, which of course reminds me of the kind of classic American genre, movie genre of of the the classic renegade um, male, um, you know, um, protagonist, whatever you want to call it. I mean, he he just he kind of personified that in ways. I mean, <clears throat> the sort of ways that he. Um, behaved um, in the school and stuff with the teachers and stuff there just seemed to be a sort of um, um, a kind of um, he's, he seemed to play quite loose with um, uh, his children's feelings and uh, or children's needs or you know the kind of people they would uh, the relationships that they would have with other people outside of the family so he does, he, he he's definitely a dichotomy I think um, you know I mean even the whole thing about disappearing to um, a different space and time and stuff. I mean, there was uh, stuff that I found really, um, yeah, I found sort of, I, I guess you could you could say confusing about the character. He, he was one, one thing and the next. Now, I know that um, Matt had something particularly to talk about the family, and I was just curious. I mean, I'm going to, I would normally introduce the show with scenes, but I'll be honest with you, I, I really struggled with finding scenes that were particularly of interest, and I'm more interested in the characters were perhaps the more interesting characters. And Cooper is definitely, obviously, being the main main character. Matthew McConaughey is his uh, real name. Um, he definitely was an intriguing character. But as was, uh, I think, his not just his daughter Murph, but also um, the son, who I can't quite quite remember who the what his name was, um, off the top of my head here now, but, um, his, uh, his name was Tom, his name was Tom, Tom okay. Cooper, Tom Cooper, okay, well, and Tom, I mean, he was uh, a very background, and this might maybe lead into some of what maybe Matt would like to talk about, but he seemed to be, um, left on the peripheries, and I, I'm going to bring in a sort of different theme here, a little bit, hopefully not override entirely, we can perhaps talk about it in more detail, but <clears throat> there was a great sense of male disposability in this film, um, more so than than I perhaps noticed anywhere before, and it, see, and it particularly came out between the relationship of Cooper with Tom, as opposed <clears throat> to the relationship that he had with Murph, his daughter. It seemed that there was a much more closer bond in some ways between his daughter and there was his son. So I was curious, I mean, I don't know if Matt, if that had been something you'd been thinking about, but um, had you any take on that at all, that particular relationship in comparison to the relationship he had with his son? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to talk in terms of the family issues um, in the film. Um, I mean, you had the absent mother, you had the brother who was... Um, maybe kind of portrayed as the robunctious young male at the beginning of the film, but by the end of the film was very as and violent. Um, and, and even with Murph, you saw how she was always very intelligent compared to her brother and, very, and, and a very uh, intellectual and bright girl at the beginning of the film, but, but by the end of the film was ready to dismiss her father and, and move on in life completely and had given up on her father and was very... Um, was very hostile um, or and, and kind of passive aggressive even in her messages and her video logs back to her father. So um, 
I mean, there's a lot to really dive in there. Um, but oh, I'll hand it back to you, Patrick. Yeah. No, I agree. And um, I just had another thought, which has just quickly left my mind as well. But um, regarding the the family dynamic, um, there was yeah, there was lots of like you said about the, the absent mother. I mean, of course, she she died of cancer, I presume. And this kind of leads into the uh, part of the other story, which comes as well. Um, which is this business of this um, terrible, what is it the blights they call it, which has descended upon the planet and has brought all these ghastly windstorms and um, all their crops are ruined and it, it seems of course it's never really entirely told, you kind of get it through um, talks with the grandfather who talked about an earlier period when there were six billion people on the planet and so you get this sense that obviously there's a great portion of the planet which is unusable, um, probably due to this blight, uh, whatever it was called, and um, and you you kind of wonder you you don't really know what's happened. There's just this kind of um, you know this vague vagueness to it all, and I think that's sort of highlighted with the family dynamic. You don't really know what's happened to this family either, and this sort of these are the kind of um, at least for me, I found to be the most confusing parts. Phil, I know that you had some thoughts about the family issue as well, and I, I wondered if you had any things you wanted to highlight on that, or perhaps we've already touched on. I would say some of it you guys have touched on. Um, it is interesting that we don't we don't know. I mean, I guess she died from cancer, but we don't really know all too much about her as a mother, um, how long it's been since, since she had died. Um, if she had died when the children were still very young, if she died in childbirth, I think it likely would have been mentioned. Uh, she's The daughter is 10 years old, I believe, and she seems to be pretty well bonded with her father. And I think maybe one reason why she and her father have got such a, a strong bond might, it could very well be that she takes so much more after him, and perhaps the son takes after the mother. We just don't know. It, certainly, the grandfather uh, at one point mentions that you know they're a caretaker generation, and and that coop, you know, he's cooped up on planet Earth. He he wants to get out there into the stars, into the solar system, and he's stuck in this place where he has to be in a caretaker generation, and so he's sort of a He's not a duck in this universe for them. Um, as far as getting into the family dynamic later on, I mean, it, it kind of will take us into some parts later into the movie. It is interesting. I, I just that scene whenever he's leaving and Murph is is crying, and it, it was just a very emotional uh, part of the movie. It, it just really had, and, and, and the actors, both of them, the child and and. Uh, McConaughey did did a wonderful job. You, re it's a visceral feeling when when he leaves, yeah. and you really get that he 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 doesn't want to leave, but this is what he's got to do to save them too. Even despite that, it still feels very bitter that he leaves. Yeah, and then, you, did, sorry to interrupt you, but um, did you really feel connected? With, I mean, I, I I certainly was visceral. I remember that. <clears throat> that scene, I, just, I, I must admit, I struggled, and perhaps this is just me, that I struggled really connecting with, because um, they didn't seem to really understand the magnitude of the situation. No, and, no. And I guess he did, but why didn't he tell them the magnitude? I guess he kind of later in the movie sort of explains that sometimes. I think it was the classic scene, I think it was used in a trailer where he, you know, you care about your kids, therefore you keep them in the dark, I suppose, and that was the inference. But yeah, you want you want them to feel secure in right. their world, and you don't want to tell them that the world is is you know on its way to dying. Mm -hmm. And so you suppose that's why he doesn't tell her. Uh, certainly, tends pretty young to be told something like that. Yeah. But regardless, he feels a tremendous amount of guilt for having left them, and there is a, there is an unconscious undertone to this movie the way I, I feel it. Uh, just the other day, uh, you know, Stefan Molyneux from Free Man Radio put out a, a video about, uh, you know, 80% of mothers feeling guilty about leaving their children to go off to work so they can maintain a, you know, two-income household. And 
there's I, I've got to think that there's it pulls it pulls a little bit on there for I think most people watching and maybe that's part of what's mm. What what the dynamic is there between this this yeah. feeling where you know you've got to you've got to go out and you've got to you know make you got to make some you know dough so you can bring it back home for the kids so they can have that good life, and in this sense, uh, you know he has to leave for their well being, and yet he still feels very guilty about it, and uh, yeah I just the the scene when he comes back after twenty three years. Uh, on the planet with the tsunami that, you know, it's like this unconscious wave of water, you know, rushes and takes them and, you know, what would have been seven years turns into 23. And when he returns back to the ship, um, Romilly, the the scientist who stayed behind, uh, they ask him, you know, why didn't you just stay asleep? And he said, something felt wrong about dreaming my life away. And there's something unconscious about this leaving and this guilt, and then the messages that he gets back. Uh, in one of the messages from his son, he, the son says, let's see here. He says, you're not listening to this. These messages are just, just drifting around in the darkness. And I mean, doesn't that kind of feel a little bit like a, a parent that is so lost in their own world that you can't even communicate with them? You know, they're, you know they're, they're so bunched up in their own troubles or their own pursuits that you can't even, the son can't, doesn't even feel like he can communicate with them. Uh, something to that, I feel. Yeah, yeah it's, the, it's the disconnect between uh, children and uh, parents is portrayed throughout the whole movie. Abandonment and disconnect and uh, especially uh, you guys talked about uh, the family dynamic and uh, I have here uh, actually a bullet point list um, entitled uh, Stupid Ideas of Interstellar so although I liked the movie I um, I really think that some things uh, could have been done better or could have been uh, left out yeah. and one of these things uh, on my bullet point list uh, of uh, Stupid Ideas of Interstellar is actually the fatherly love theme and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this, uh, especially when uh, the movie mixes it with science. Uh, and just hear me out, I'm going to try to make a case of this. Um, so the, the fatherly love theme permeates uh, throughout the whole movie. I think we can agree uh, upon this. So um, the whole base upon, inter which, upon which Interstellar was built was the love that Cooper feels for his daughter. Although somewhat unclearly, the movie um, depicts this love as a powerful uh, interdimensional force. Uh, when Cooper, um, um, fueled by love, transcends into the fifth dimension. And at that point, I was like, hmm, what? You know, I, I had to wonder uh, in that scene, uh, if love uh, powers the fifth dimension, uh, is there maybe a sixth dimension powered by guilt and then maybe a seventh one powered by anger? Right. Well, you know, uh, in its classic uh, Hollywood sugary style, when it comes to the fatherly love theme, uh, the movie abandons all reason and abandons even the illusion of science upon which it's built <clears throat> and, uh, in my opinion, dives headfirst into what I can only call an emotional masturbation of the worst kind. I know these are big words, <laughs> but um, right. I was curious, uh, what did you guys think about the power of love of an absent father that transcends dimensions to, to reach the children that he left behind and, oh no, wait, I'm sorry, to, I mean to reach, to reach the daughter that he left behind because, you know, he doesn't seem too concerned with the boy since uh, males are not that important and are usually disposable. Yeah, I, I def, I mean, certainly there was the disc. There was definitely a, a kind of very obvious. Um, um, I mean, I think somebody um, re referred to the relationship with the daughter as slightly incestuous. Now, I don't know if I'd necessarily take it to that extreme, but certainly there was a um, compared to the relationship he was having with his son, it was it, it didn't make sense what um this 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 bond this particular bonding that he had with his daughter at, which was to some degree at the expense of his son that said he did sort of kind of support his son at times i mean obviously at the in the interview at the school and stuff he did you know he didn't want him just to be a farmer <clears throat> he you know he 
wanted him to go to university and stuff like that. So he had some kind of um, um, care about his abilities. But of course, you could argue, you could argue, of course, I don't know, maybe this is just my thoughts on it, but um, you could argue that was his own sort of egotistical side, wanting his son to be as successful or as highly educated as he was, perhaps. And so it might not have been them. Um, because, of course, what he says about his son and then what he, how he acts around his son are two totally different things. And um, he, he's a utility, essentially. Um, I get the sense. And um, he's not somebody to, uh, to nurture it and uh, stuff. Then again, I had another theory on this whole thing. Um, if I'm rushing off, people close me in and talk less, you know, about something specific, but I had this other theory where you know this is like a, a sort of a form of um, you know like protect like a, a tribal situation whereby you know the men would protect the women in terms of protecting the, the future generations etc. So you you know perhaps there's some of that part partly to do with it. But as far as a family situation, it just it felt very dysfunctional to me. I agree. It was very dysfunctional, but uh, it's it models mostly what you see in the world. And for example, I don't find it difficult at all to uh, see why the Coop bonded with his daughter more than he did with his son, because Coop was clearly a scientist. He had an engineering type of mentality, explorer mentality, and uh, his son was more of a farmer, just willing to do the kind of things that you do on a farm. And his daughter was much more exploratory, scientific oriented. So, you know, it's natural to me to, to see that he would bond more with somebody that is more like himself, but he did exhibit some care with his son. Like you say, he guided him and wanted to see him go to university. Um, but his son, you know, didn't clearly bond with him. He was pretty resentful, I think. That's that's the impression I got from from the body language and the, and the way that he, uh, I don't know, I just didn't think his son had a strong bond with his dad. He said when yeah, he left, now, can I have your truck? You know, like 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 he wouldn't have known that if, his, if he was bonded with his father. He would know his tr the truck is a no big deal at all, but that was his focus. Right. Yeah, but now you know here it's uh, the the whole conundrum of what came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, you mentioned, and it's the whole uh, nature versus nurture. You mentioned that uh, um, his daughter was able to connect with him better because she was more um, scientifically oriented, and the uh, son was not that interested. But my question is: Is this because maybe since birth, Cooper dedicated? more time and more attention to his daughter and kind of neglected his son. Is this a result of nurture or is this nature? I would argue for nurture. I would say that uh, the relationship between him and his son, uh, of course, is established by the father to begin with, by the parent. And if it's what it is, it's Cooper's fault since he well, is the father. That's a, and that's a very good point. Yeah. But you got to remember also that, that the daughter was the youngest, and of course he in his and there's a fairly large gap between the age of the son and the daughter, and the, the son had already grown to the point where he was more or less had his identity and was is off on his own doing his own thing. He was he was further along in the development process, so it would be natural that he would be more focused on the daughter later in time than than his son. I don't know. Yeah. I think I kind of uh, I'm just kind of confused by the whole. Uh, relationship dynamic between them in general. Um, uh, I think I can remember that there were scenes in which um, uh, the son, he would bully Murph uh, at times and he, he would call her names and things like that and I got the impression that uh, Cooper would give more attention to Murph mainly because she wasn't as well adjusted as uh, the son was. That, that, that was my takeaway from it. Yeah, I wouldn't be too surprised if there was this sibling um, animosity, of course, if if the father was showing uh, more <laughs> attention to one than the other, it, it, it wouldn't entirely surprise me that that would be the outcome of it. So I'm not sure I can particularly hold the, the son entirely responsible for that. But, um, I, so. I would say that the double standard is portrayed very well in the scene where he is leaving. Uh, and he caters to his daughter's feelings so much. He goes up in her room, he hugs her, he makes promises, he cries, his heart is torn apart, uh, and then he comes downstairs and uh, he kind of uh, halfway hugs his, 
his son and then not only that he does not cater to his feelings but he's like you're responsible I, I don't remember exactly what he says but he kind of leaves with uh, you're responsible now for the family man up you know um, <clears throat> step up and and uh, uh, take responsibility and has absolutely no interest in mm. in the feelings of the son I mean he's abandoning two children Right. And he acts like he only has one. I, at least, uh, and it's weird to me that I'm in a hangout with so many men, and I'm the only woman that will <laughs> that will push forward the idea. Yeah, no, uh, I'm with, of, I'm with uh, you totally. I, I to I'm totally with you on um on this. I, I I kind of agree with you. I mean, it sort of sets the theme in a sense. I mean, I I mean. You know, male disposability is a big thing. I guess I guess um in modern media these days, modern films, TV shows, etc. Um, and it was pretty pretty rife throughout this movie. I mean, it wasn't just um, in terms of the son, which I, uh, the relationship between him and his son, which I thought was kind of clinched it for me entirely. But there was various moments of male disposability throughout the, the film. Uh, you know, the guy that got um, left for 23 years up on, on a space station, uh, you know, the guy who, who, who Died um, trying to rescue the lady um, um, from the uh, from the the watery <clears throat> from the uh, watery planet uh, Miller's Miller's planet, I believe. Um, so yeah, there's 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 a lot. Of, I think there's a lot lot of lot of that going on in this movie. And I wouldn't normally. I think you know because because sometimes it sort of happens by osmosis in a lot of movies these days. But I think in this particular one, it was pretty stark and very, very clear, you know. Yeah, anyway. just just to add to yeah. your list of uh, uh, scenes of male disposability, disposability is um, the scene when he's headed into the black hole and yeah. he ejects her and saves her while he sacrifices himself. Of course. Kind of gritty style. Remember uh, yeah, yeah, uh, George course. Clooney in Gravity when he detaches himself and uh, uh, lets thing, himself... Yeah. Yeah, it's all. Uh, it it brought back uh, that scene so much for me, and yeah, that yeah. that could be added to the list of uh, uh, scenes that portray male, male disposability. So, yeah. is that male disposability though? I mean, he lied to the girl too, right? He told her that they they both could go, but then he like in his mind he knew the whole time that uh, it would be too much weight or whatever. No, I I think yeah, he, I would, he lied he lied to save her. He lied to save her and to send her on her way while he sacrifices himself and goes into the unknown and the the in, towards the danger. At least I don't know. That's that's uh, how it came across to me. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I I kind of took it as like he considered himself older and she was you know uh, younger and stuff. He probably thought that. Uh, you know, she has more to live for than I do. So, so you think it was a matter of age, not of sex? Uh, it, I mean, it, it could be a lot of things. Uh, maybe, maybe it was his like, you know, uh, his grand sense of altruism. Something, you know, took him over like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, it's just, I, I think, obviously, all these things are interpreted to some degree. <clears throat> But I, uh, there is there is a strong theme of disposability, the male disposability particularly going on. It, yeah, there's perhaps different dynamics going on in that, and I, I'm quite sure you can interpret them in all, um, all kinds of ways. But you know, it's funny we talked about honesty. You just talked, Ada, you were talking about the 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 fact that he lied to her about you know going her coming with him. Now, honesty seems to be. <laughs> But something which was hugely lacking in this movie. I mean, we've already touched on the. I already touched earlier about how Cooper wasn't particularly honest with his family, or particularly with his daughter, about about the um, about the nature of the trip that he was going on. Although he does talk about a very weird sort of thing about how how she could come back, uh, how the, he could come back, and they might be the same age, which um, I thought was kind of. Um, <laughs> Kind of unusual, an unusual thing to say to your daughter uh, the best of times. But um, but there was also a really funny scene with the um the robots. So I, I actually uh, robots I thought were quite funny in this uh, in this film, not just be deliberately because their humour setting was set to 100%, which uh, their actual humour was uh, was quite poor, but uh, but their actual 
playing out in the in the film was actually quite um, funny. And they they had a he talked about uh, the robot talked about an honesty setting being set at ninety percent. And I thought this this whole film was since littered. I mean, there was also the um, the the main scientist uh, played by Michael Caine. <clears throat> I mean, he'd lied to everybody. Um, there seemed to, there seemed to be no character uh, other than perhaps uh, the children it's themselves um, and maybe some of the sideline characters that actually hadn't lied at all in this. Uh, it seemed to be. It seemed to be littered with dishonesty in places. I don't know if anybody else had caught that at all, or any, had any thoughts on it. Yeah, it's true. Um, I was completely confused at why uh, Michael Caine bothered to lie about that whole thing. Right. Like uh, well, uh, Plan B. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I thought that was yeah. just a question. Yeah. Um, plan uh, like Plan B was his only option the whole time. Uh, I don't really understand why, uh, uh, why like it, he he didn't make that known, you know. Well, uh, professor pr professor's brand reasoning is that um, people would not cooperate in order to save humanity. He he thought that they needed to believe that they were saving themselves. Therefore, he ends up lying about Plan A in order for his Plan B to succeed. And um, I think uh, this is a very individualistic theme, and I know Matt had something uh, to say about this. Uh, Matt, do you want to take it over from here? Um, yeah, so they lied because um, <laughs> nobody would, kind of like what you're saying, Eddie, they wouldn't, um, nobody would uh, be willing to, I mean, it would be total chaos um, in, in society if, if nobody believed that they would uh, have any chance of survival and that all their efforts was just to um, create colonies off-world. Um, and I mean, and just to backtrack a second to um, Tom the son, um, <laughs> the grandfather was pretty integral to, to maintaining his stability and, and maintaining him as a character. And when he died, that was also a transitional moment which really changed the film and, and led Tom to become much more aggressive and uh, kind of dysfunctional. Um, and, and then with the AI, uh, Patrick, uh, they were, they, they, not only were they kind of like the humor, humorous settings in the uh, film, but they were integral to the plot because they ended up help, helping to solve um, the, the equation and, and ended up allowing uh, Plan A to succeed. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah. Well, um, okay. I don't know if anybody else had anything to say on that. I, I thought it was just an intriguing part of it, and I, I think I will think more on that um, for the Afterthoughts show because it's uh, the, the dishonesty or a lack of honesty seems to be a sort of big part of it, which uh, I found quite interesting. But the other part, <clears throat> and I know uh, Dimitri had some uh, thoughts on this, and and I know that Philip had touched on them as well earlier. Was the was the religious symbolism and Christian symbolism, mystic symbolism? I guess there's certainly a sort of mysticism I think surrounding the kind of quantum mechanics theory, and sort of a lot of people do say it's so. And of course, I'll get hounded by scientist people who tell me I'm wise. And I, I will say I'm, I am ignorant of this type of stuff. I don't, I don't, I don't pretend to understand it. I, I think I understand the sort of concept of it, but I, I don't, I don't necessarily understand the mathematics or to that degree. But there, there, there definitely did seem to be a sense with the dimension, the dimensional aspects to, uh, to it all, and. You know that love and all of that kind of stuff was uh, was very much a part of it. But I'm curious about the symbolism that you saw in the um, that you particularly talked to us about before the show. You talked about the Christian symbolism, Dimitri, and I was yeah, curious. It, it's, um, I, I, I I don't know what to make of it. I just thought it was funny that there there were exactly twelve scientists and twelve possible target worlds that could be colonized. I mean, uh, yeah. Jesus and the 12 apostles. You know, any, any, I just thought that was kind of yeah, really be a coincidence. Yeah, there was also a direct reference to Lazarus, of course, wasn't there? Which uh, yeah. 
which uh, was a very biblical, biblical yeah. thing. I just I just chalked it up as hey, you know, it's still an American movie. It's a, very much a religious society for the most yeah. part, and it's uh, they figured they're probably gonna uh, it's gonna help sales, and they probably did. Who knows? Or, or I don't know. I don't think it's unusual uh, the use of religion. I mean, I um I see the use of religion probably in most movies. Um, yeah. And even actually, I just watched The Matrix recently again, and I, I saw religious aspects in that as well. So it's a sort of um, we se- we tend to think we live in this secular atheist sort of world, and of course, uh, you know, oh, we're far from it. Yeah, we're as rational philosophers we are probably, but but um, but yeah, in the real world, um, yeah, it's very much a very much a mystical one. Did you have any thoughts, Phil, yourself, more on that to extrapolate further, perhaps on on the religious or the mystical parts that you perhaps saw. Yeah, yeah, there was, um, just this morning I, I put the soundtrack on just to kind of put my mind back in that space of the movie. It's such a powerful soundtrack, really carry helps carry the film as any good movie needs, you know, a good good music, a good sound, good effects to go along with it. The soundtrack is, it, it's kind of unique. There's, uh, or the score, I should say, There there's a lot of pipe organs, there's not a lot of strings, there's not a lot of I'm not sure if there's any drums. This, it, to me, almost had like a, a, a mass, like a cathedral-like presence, especially to the to the high moments, but to the low moments too. There's there, a very soft, subtle, uh, higher pitch pipe organ, and then in the dramatic bits, it gets very low, and and that's rife throughout the whole thing. And so I kind of wondered if that connects to some of the mystical, potentially religious and mythical aspects of the movie, and. If you break down the movie into three sections, there's the beginning of the movie, which is an end time story with the blight, the impending doom on Earth, very much kind of an apocalyptic type setting that's that's coming forward there. And then moving into the middle of the movie, there's a scene where Brand and Cooper are talking about evil, and they do... There's, I wouldn't, I'm not sure that it's necessarily a reference to original sin, but certainly they do talk about how there's, there's no evil in the universe, but it's what man brings with him. And in the case of this movie and its characters, it's what Doctor Man brings to the movie. Is right. he is the villain in the, in the movie? And I thought Matt Damon did. Yeah, I hope I'm not spoiling it for anybody. Uh, spoilers are, of course, we're well into it now. But that, <laughs> that was actually a surprise to me. Uh, I didn't realize Matt Damon was going to be in the movie, and I thought he did a great job as a villain. I, I kind of hope he gains a bunch of weight and just starts playing villains like Marlon Brando from here on out. It was good. He was really good, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he, and he had some great lines, as villains uh, tend to. Uh, you know, it was his isolation that, that turned him uh, sour, and it, and it was his, his worldview was one of a, a survival at any cost, Versus brands, which was more central towards love, and so what you get then is is this this fight between good and evil in the second chunk of the movie, right. and then and then you get a miracle, <laughs> which is a uh, kind of like the uh, the part where he drops into the to the black hole, and I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. We can talk about that later, and then of course with the conclusion of the film, you have. Uh, a rebirth, a genesis. You have, you know, Eve, and you have Adam. And if Coop arrives there, we're to assume that there will be an Adam and Eve type uh, society. So I, that's kind of where I'm coming from when I say that there's s- certain strings and connections to the to the mythical within the movie. Yeah. And and the sound just just carries you all the way through the movie. And and and, and I'm not if it's a theme that we're supposed to walk away from feeling stronger in our faith type thing, then, I, then of course, I, I'm not feeling so good about that. No. But but as far as reincorporating myths and stuff, it, it was effective in that regard. So. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, <clears throat> to extrapolate further, I guess, for me would be the, the mysticism does go into the science almost. I think you sort of uh, inferred that earlier in the call. And um, there is a sort of, I mean, I I realise that with stuff like quantum mechanics and um, string theory, whatever you want to call it, or the you know, and of course I'm probably using unchoice words here because I'm not particularly up on the, the absolute details, um, but um, there did seem to be some kind of um, 
parts of the science that was almost mystical as well, and um, which sort of um, furthered that kind of um, theme to the whole movie a little bit. Well, it's it's in that realm. I mean, uh, the science when you're talking about quantum physics and quantum mechanics, and there is a difference. Uh, actually, the movie I think is more based on quantum physics than it is quantum mechanics. Nevertheless, that's a detail. Um, <clears throat> the the uh, the mysticism is is kind of natural when you're starting to push the edge of of uh, of empirical knowledge versus things that you're trying to investigate. Uh, <clears throat> I thought that whole scene. You know, since we're talking about the scene of the the three-dimensional space that whoever it was constructed for us to uh, transcend the barriers of time with gravity. I thought that whole scene was just miraculous and amazing. I was very much astounded by it, and it was uh, it resonated strongly with me. The <clears throat> the that whole third section of the movie, as you mentioned, uh, <clears throat> Philip if you broke it down into the three sections, that third section of the movie was where the most ambiguity, uh, the, the lot of lot of things jumped ahead, uh, there were a lot of disconnected dots, you know, that just didn't seem to f meld well together, and, uh, but that one scene with the, I, I really focused in a lot on that scene where the three-dimensional space was, and when we're talking about inconsistencies, I mean, supposedly it was it was not any external being, it was themselves that were talking back in time. So that whole thing about who they were is is mysterious and, and weird as well. I didn't fully understand how it was, I mean, whoever these beings were, and the beings were themselves, uh, that constructed this three-dimensional space out of a five-dimensional world, which is what the TARS robot told Coop when he started talking to the robot. He says, yeah, this was this is a, a three-dimensional space that they constructed for us, you know, and, and, and that was confused by that. So it was an inconsistency with regard to the whole flow of the story, I thought. Yeah, and, and, and also, too, it's I, I, I'm sure maybe others might have seen it and picked up on it as well, but it's, it's kind of to this... Uh, Paradox. I think Adi had talked about it before. With in some circles, it's called the bootstrap theory, and I think probably in the movie circles, it's called that. Uh, from a religious standpoint, we could call it the ontological theory, where what you know, it is sort of a what came first, the chicken or the egg. If Cooper is supposed to go into the gravitational, you know, vortex, the black hole, to get the information, and then send back the information, how does he like? How does he send himself the message that gets him to NASA? That that starts this whole thing up, it becomes very much turtles all the way down in a godlike type way. And how are these godlike humans who ascended to this fifth dimension? How how do they get there without Cooper first getting them off the planet and sustaining human life long enough for them to advance that far? Yeah, my only my only theory. Was, and of course it's a completely amateur theory in all of this and this sort of me learning the science as I went along or more after the movie but I sort of got the sense that if there is this time dilation that's going on in the universe and there are people out there that um, um, that are able to not necessarily connect with us physically or anything but able to connect with us through some kind of um, um, alternative or communication through physics or something maybe this is what they've created as a, as a, as a way as a as an as a way to get through you know um, I, that was the way that I sort of kind of interpreted that but whether or not I'm talking out of my arse or has any sort of validity or so I don't know I mean this is where I <clears throat> I think there was a lot of abstraction that caused me a certain amount of confusion and I you know perhaps filling in the gaps here with my own sort of thoughts on it but yeah, well, I, uh, I think I think the movie has a big problem, and I know I've been hating on it. <laughs> Although I told you guys that I I enjoyed aspects of it. Um, mm. After I saw it, a few problems uh, started to come back to me, and um, bother they 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 kept bugging me. So uh, one of the main ones was the time travel paradox. Um, while uh, uh, while I was watching the movie, this didn't really bother me, as I said before. Um, af after leaving the theater, it uh, it became uh, very uh, quite a quite a nuisance. So, how did future humans survive the first time to make the tesseract? Tesseract being the the singularity that holds the the wormhole open and uh, the place, the miraculous place in which Cooper ends up. 
uh, as uh, Phil mentioned before. And uh, so, so how did future humans, uh, how did they survive the first time to make the Tesseract and uh, to send it back in time? They, they didn't have a wormhole to save them the first time around. So if uh, humanity was able to find a way to survive and ascend to higher dimensions without the wormhole, then you know why bother sending it back to begin with? So um, I know Matt also had a few problems uh, with this time travel paradox. Um, I don't know what were your thoughts on it, Matt. Yeah, I mean, that's the giant unanswered question. It's like, um, you know, how did the uh, future humans survive in the first place uh, without the placement of the Tesseract? So, you know, how does that whole time cycle kickstart? And it's, it's one of those vague questions that um, that this film kind of leaves open and that a lot of science fiction films and, and shows tend to do where they don't want to provide definite answers, but they want to leave it open to interpretation um, and uh, and and kind of and kind of guessing and inspiration um, for the audience, which is it's <laughs> I guess it's a pro and a con at the same time to have that. Um, we can kind of get frustrated at that technicality, but I think it's something that has been in film for a long time and is going to be uh, here to stay where you have these little generalities, um, you know. So I guess you can't really you can't really jump on that, but I also wanted to add um, the plan A uh, situation to kind of fit into the Christian imagery uh, hypothesis. Like the whole, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's basically Noah's Ark. Um, in a sense, like the giant ship that uh, goes into space to um, provide a colony. I mean, it's uh, that's basically Noah's Ark, and right. yeah. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> no, that's a good point. Definitely Noah's Ark. <clears throat> but um, I know, Amy, you you said because we were talking about this just before the show, and I think some of the I think I do think sometimes, um, you know quantum physics or string theory, whatever, these things can be highly confusing to people, to the to the masses of people, and I, I include myself in that, of course, to some degree. And they, but you 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 said an interesting thing which made me laugh. You said that's because the plot line was awful or something. And I, I just wanted to hear more about that. Well yeah. the plot line the plot line has a lot of holes in it and and I, I really I, I had something that I enjoyed about the movie but um, I didn't want to keep hammering uh, with the negatives and uh, well you want to hear uh, the negatives lady. Go for it. okay 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 because because you know I, I come across as as a interstellar hater and I, I I enjoyed some aspects of it although those aspects are not related to the dialogue or the the plot or or the science but anyway um, speaking of plot uh, you know uh, it's very shaky if the future humans wanted to save the past humans they could have given the professor the equation that he couldn't solve I mean you know the the solution is simple enough to be transmitted in Morse code it's not like it's that complicated yeah. or you know even better they, the future humans, could have given the past humans a cure for the crops. <laughs> humans could have stayed on Earth and uh, all their problems would have been solved. If they are so advanced and so intelligent, then why do they need to make these poor past humans jump through such incredible hoops in order to survive? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, think about it. Advanced beings would solve problems like uh, Earth is running out of food in the simplest way possible. Now right. their plan is one of the most irrational things that one can ever imagine. The chances of success are extremely unlikely and um, uh, the journey uh, which is really long and many people die waiting for this whole crazy and complicated scenario to unfold when the whole problem could have been solved with a simple Morse, Morse code transmission. Right. So I did enjoy the visuals of the movie. I, I don't want to take it aw take away from it, but the plot does not make any sense to me. And and I consider myself to be much less rational and less intelligent than an interdimensional being. So I was wondering if any of you guys were bothered at all by this excuse for a plot. 
Um, yeah, I kind of noticed that too, just a teeny bit. Um, I think maybe the uh, wormhole in the Tesseract is perhaps some kind of um, some kind of metaphor for religious salvation or some kind of um, some kind of crucible for humanity. Um, of course, <laughs> of course, um, the the new humans sweeping down through the galaxies and saving humanity in an instant 80 would make for a lot less of a good movie. So, right. <laughs> but I rest, I rest my case. <laughs> That's fair enough, Matt. I, I know that Motec Man had a lot to say about the black hole, and um, I was uh, so I think this is kind of a great point to come to because we've kind of been touching on the Tesseract and I must just to give you my feelings about it I was deeply confused by that whole scene um, I found it interesting in, in one sense but then I, I couldn't get a, a sense of where he was at I mean it was weird he wasn't in a spaceship he was floating in this kind of weird place and um, and I got that it was all about spice not spice rather space and time but um, but yeah, I'm curious, Botek man, what, what what were your thoughts about that? And I, you know, go to go into detail, please help me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure how much detail I can get into, other than to just relate how it felt to me more than anything. I thought the representation. I mean, I'd never heard of the term tesseract before, so I looked it up. Thanks for the link. And uh, I've seen that. I've seen the pictures before of that type of thing. I just didn't know what the label for it was. But but it just really seemed to portray time in a very interesting geographical manner that uh, uh, the thing that I thought was hokey about the scene or that uh, was puzzling and kind of mysterious was, was how gravity was a, was uh, was affecting things I mean I, I kind of get it but but like for example at the end when Murphy was finally got the, the watch hand second hand was being uh, manipulated and messages were coming through there I mean unless she got everything at that moment in time, I mean, did she take the watch with her and continue to, I mean, because there's a lot of, I mean, to solve an equation as complex as the one they had written on the board, there's no way that it would just be a simple little thing for them to, to uh, oh, I'll just give you a couple of pieces of information. In fact, even the TARS robot said, you know, that's just so much stuff to, try, to, uh, to communicate. So right. that was kind of mysterious, and I thought that was a little bit a little bit Hollywood to, to transcend that gap there, but but that's all right. I mean, it's easy to suspend your disbelief when when it comes to stuff like that when you're pushing the fringes of science. But the the whole tesseract and representation of it, I thought was really quite neat of how they folded each image in a different um, element of time in each of the different segments of that geometry. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. The only time I've ever come across a tesseract before was when I played um, played a computer, played the um, oh gosh, I can't remember the computer game now <laughs> off the top of my head. But uh, but yeah, it's it's a probably a good term for it. Like you say, it, it segments. It's like a uh, time and space and stuff. It is um, yeah, it, it it is what it what it says it is. I I just I guess I couldn't just could not connect with that. That strange place. It just seemed like was he in space? Where you know, and it just was just a very abstract place. Well, it's me. what the, what what the Tars robot explained is it was a it was a three dimensional space constructed by the five dimensional beings. Right. And and so yeah, it was odd. In fact, at the very end of that scene, it started collapsing. And then that's another part of the mystery, you know, this whole three-dimensional space that these beings, the, the, the future humans or whoever they were, constructed uh, to, to allow Coop to transmit this information backwards in time, started collapsing, and then suddenly, poof, he's awakened. You know, I mean, that, that was the weirdest thing, is that there was a huge gap there, in my view, of how you transcended from that scene into him oh, awakening in a whole other place. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just for for our listeners, uh, the tesseract <coughs> is actually uh, <coughs> a filter or an adapter, if you want, that translates the fifth dimension into three-dimensional visibility. So this way, uh, Cooper can visit his daughter at any point in time, and and he also is able to um, shake Amel Amelia's hand um, uh, inside the wormhole when they travel. If you guys remember. But what uh, what is really interesting about the Tesseract is um, 
uh, that what NASA believed was a single alien race uh, inside the Tesseract uh, is actually three separate but related entities. Uh, who do we have in there? We have uh, future humans who have mastered the laws of our universe, uh, allowing them to manipulate time and space. And then uh, the second entity is Cooper, attempting to communicate with his daughter from inside the Tesseract. And then the third entity is TARS, the robot, who Cooper sent into the black hole to collect and transmit data. So uh, that's a little bit of info about the Tesseract since uh, it's, it's kind of complicated. I got this information from the movie and, uh, and um, I also had to research a little bit because it was confusing for me also. Can I float a theory out there? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, one thing that's interesting, the lines that Matt Damon is putting out there, a lot of it has to do with his transformation uh, or I suppose his culmination into a, an evil villain character, but also too, remember that he says that line to Cooper, he says um, the last, statistically we know the last thing that you'll see before you die is your, is your, your kids, you know, they're, they care about you, they love you, they're going to be there, you know, when you die and when Cooper goes through the the black or goes into the black hole and into the tesseract, he sees his his daughter, and I you know it's one of those types of theories you throw out there a lot. Does someone die at this point, and he's imagining the rest of it as a death dream type thing? There's that one line from Matt Damon that that I think leads that theory, and then another interesting point which my brother brought up to me when I went and saw it the second time with him, he said. Uh, didn't you think it was interesting that they never did anything with that joke at the beginning? Remember that joke at the beginning when he's in the parent-teacher conference and they say, or it's not so much, it's, it's a joke to us because, you know, we, I think, more or less believe that this, uh, the moon landing actually happened, but they say, oh, the moon landing, that was all faked. Right. It was, you know, they, it was just to bankrupt the Soviets and, and that, you know, none of it actually happened. And, of course, he has a, a lunar, or his daughter has that lunar lander sitting on the bookshelf and it gets knocked off and broken. But in this world, at least, it, that never happened. And so this artifact that he has, uh, it, it's kind of a falsity. Or it, it's I, basically that, I think there's something in that. There's a token there that we're, maybe we could look into that or mm -hmm. talk about that. I, I wonder if maybe he doesn't, if it's not possible that he actually dies whenever he goes into the Tesseract and that he's actually having a, a death dream and imagining that he sees his his children and that the rest of his line, at least, that we see isn't actually happening. Brand certainly could be happening. We see her at the end and we never see Cooper meet up with her at the end. So, yeah, yeah, it left a lot of uh, left me with a, uh, the end <clears throat> certainly left me with a lot of confusion, a lot of um, difficulty really connects with what what they were talking about. And I think some of that comes out from what Aidy's just said about perhaps a bit of a poor pot plot line. And I'm very surprised by Nolan. I mean Nolan I I mean one of my most favourite movies uh, was the was The Dark Knight, uh, which I think was one of his best, frankly, at least for me. Um so I was surprised how how uh yeah sort of vague sometimes some of this was and how it sort of disappeared into Often disappeared into the same kind of stories that you hear, that you've seen in movies time and time again. <clears throat> I will say the one thing they didn't do, and sorry, this perhaps a little bit of a distraction. No love interest. Thank, thank God for that. There was no love interest. I mean, he was kind of all tarred up for a love interest, of course, being this sort of macho, sort of you know, renegade chap. But there was no love interest, and I thought that was uh, that was an interesting. That was like a cliche they didn't fall into. And uh, are you sure, Patrick? Wasn't uh, isn't it possible that the love interest was the Anne Hathaway character, and that's what at the very very end of the movie he went back to save her? No, there's the, there is the thing, there is the idea that it could be a sequel, right? Isn't there? Of course. Yeah. Yes. I mean, maybe. Who knows? Maybe yes, he I has, but he certainly didn't display any kind of feelings of, you know. Uh, interest in her, I don't think. Well, I, uh, speaking of the ending, uh, since you guys uh, 
uh, arrived at the ending already. I I will end my list of uh, things that I didn't like about the movie here. <laughs> so um, um, at the end of the movie, Cooper, you know, it's uh, 125 years old, uh, 24, 25 years old in uh, Earth time. But Amelia Brand didn't go with Cooper inside the black hole. Therefore, you know, time must have passed much faster for her since she did not get that close to the gravitational field that slows time inside the black hole. So she should be much older at the end of the movie. Instead, you know, when Cooper gets into the spaceship and he heads back to her planet, the camera shows um, um, Amelia Brand being the same age. At this point, I have to say that another movie started to play in my head, <laughs> and I saw Matthew McConaughey turning to the camera and, um, you know, just like he did in Dazed and Confused, saying, that's what I like about space travel. The women get older, but I stay the same age. <laughs> so um, <laughs> what did you guys think about the, the ending? Uh, was it satisfying or not? Are they setting up uh, the scene, like Pat said, for a sequel, or... You know, were they just out of good ideas for a captivating conclusion? That was my exact idea, of the exact thought. It was setting it up for a sequel. That's that's all I had to say about it. Yeah, um, I kind of noticed um, again with the Christian uh, symbology of of Cooper maybe being an Adam and um, that Anne Hathaway character maybe being an Eve in the sense that she went to this uh, place. Uh, didn't and her true love was dead, you know, and so she's left with this colony of um, eggs to of like these fertilized embryos to um, to try to raise on her own. Um, so I thought that was very interesting and a little vague and unclear, but um, it it was satisfying enough because it provided enough information and conclusion on Plan A for me. So. Plan B was, it, it was almost as if Plan B didn't succeed as well as Plan A did. Right, right. Yeah, I must admit, I mean, I think my some of my confusion was me being this typically typical Englishman where I'm trying to be fair on everything. And um, I think I think the movie plotline did, did fail quite badly and uh, there wasn't much that I could really get from this kind of... Um, this story that I that I've often got from before, and I, I I take Phil's view in this particular instance, which he talks about at the beginning, was I, I tend to look at these things as potentially like a dream, but I, I even a dream state I can't really get my I can't get any particular handle on this film in any particular way, and it, it seems like that that was something that other people felt, and whilst I. I've criticised it there pretty, pretty badly. I mean, I, I did, I did enjoy the movie as a sort of visceral experience, and, and particularly as Phil mentioned earlier, um, the soundtrack is simply awesome. I mean, there's some great scenes with the soundtrack, <clears throat> particularly the uh, scene as he leaves the house when he goes off to, to, uh, to the space station to uh, take off in the rocket. You know, there's a, there's a great scene with the, with the jeep and. Um, the dust and the corn and the, and this music that plays, you know, some really great scenes in it, but but really, I don't know, just it just felt like the whole thing was like a dysfunctional apocalypse story and uh, with a dysfunctional family attached to it, and uh, and uh, I don't know, I don't know, what, I don't want to be too too harsh on it, but I just uh, I just think um, my own thoughts and listening to how other people have experienced it, I just curious if if that makes any sense to people or it resonates with them at all. Maybe I'm just being unfair. Well, yeah, it does resonate with me very much since I've been hating. I feel like I've been hating on the movie so far and um, um, I just wanted to address one of the things that I actually liked about it and uh, uh, except the visuals, of course. Um, it was one of the themes that we haven't discussed yet and I think it's of great importance. Uh, and I would like to call this theme uh, the man versus nature and the man versus man theme. So if you guys remember the Waterworld planet, the first planet where they where they land, 
uh, that yeah. was more like a was man versus was planet, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, I, I don't really remember the name of the scientist, so uh, the, I call it the water world planet. So uh, this was more like a man versus nature challenge, while the next planet, Dr. Man's planet, was a man versus man challenge. I think uh, the choice of, of name in the case of uh, Dr. Man, which is spelled with M, it's spelled M A N N with two men's two, with two N's. Uh, the choice of name in 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 the case of uh, Doctor Man uh, is not random at all. After you know fighting and surviving yeah. the forces of nature on the first planet, the crew has to face now man. Right. In the movie, the survival of the entire human species is is put in danger by this petty scientist who, although, you know, he agreed to go on a near suicide mission, is just too, too afraid to die, a uh, total, uh, uh, totally typical human trait. So by contrasting the two planets with their two different dangers, the movie, uh, I think it's portraying very well the human fight for survival who, you know, has always been fought on two separate fronts, man against nature and then man against himself. So um, I don't know. Right. Have you guys uh, noticed uh, this uh, this contrast and these two different uh, fronts of the fight? Well, now you bring it up, I, I do. I do notice it now. Yeah, it's um, yeah, and that's that's not unusual for for names of people to be uh, to be a part of the storyline. I think you know. I was yeah, was... and and also too, you have to remember that conversation that they had in the space station. I think before they go down to sleep before maybe it's before they go through the wormhole I'm not exactly sure but it's kind of it's before they go to Miller's planet that when they talk about the nature of evil to some degree and that nature is not evil in itself but that that it's man's you know inherent quality that that allows for evil to exist in the world and if you juxtapose that with Anne Hathaway's talk about love having a, a force in the or being a force that maybe has some redeeming qualities, then you do see that uh, you know she's the one that starts the brand new world, and it's Mr. It's Doctor Man who is the evil you know character that they have to struggle against. And it's and it's also it's kind of interesting too because Doctor Man's worldview is it's stark and it's cold, it's unempathetic, whereas Doctor Brand's view is more empathetic, more understanding. The world that they hope to create. Uh, they well, it was another thing too is uh, Damon talks about having no attachments, that he has no attachments, and that's one of the reasons why he was selected for the mission. Right. And had he had attachments, maybe he would have had more of an empathy for, for sure. what would happen if he if he you know follows through and does the things that he does. That he he nearly puts the entire species on uh, you know in, in a place of of certain death. So. I think also too with the struggle with the, it, it, it's nature is not really overcome it takes a life but it is it's the fight in inside the self that Dr. Man loses and then he becomes the you know the evil that they must fight so there there's there's a lot of interesting things going on there hmm. Hmm. Yeah did anyone else have anything more they wanted to add about it um anything particular that we may have missed um any uh, personal stuff? I mean, you know, we're happy to hear more. Yeah, um, on the kind of man situation and the plan A, um, it was interesting. I kind of, I don't know, I kind of noticed the pro-individualism and anti-sacrifice message where because Brand ends up being wrong and man, he's proven wrong and he's stopped in the end. It, it kind of made me think about is this really, like, to what extent are they trying to argue for or try to make a metaphor for um, uh, the kind of argument for a rational self-interest in, in the continuation of the species? I thought it was an interesting kind of um, message there. Yeah, I actually, you, you just reminded me, Rahul, of a particular theme that sort of came to me watching it again today was um, was there is this kind of sense I mean I, I think there was a conversation he was having uh, that Cooper was having with the grandfather 
and the grandfather was, this, was telling him about time in, in a morium, like when there was six billion people, and they all wanted, they all, they all, I, I can't, I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, but they all selfishly wanted their everything, you know, and stuff like that. And it just kind of reminded me that this, the blight just kind of reminded me of this kind of idea of global warming and stuff. And there's a sort of political, seemed to be a political bent. I, it was difficult for me to tell which side of the of the the, the that particular s debate the director or the story writer was on. Particularly, it's not really clear. But there's certainly this, there's certainly this kind of. Um, um, this very popular kind of um, um, meme that goes around in, in most most people's circles that somehow mankind is the destroyer of mankind. You know that somehow mankind destroys the planet. You know destroys. You know can't. You know has is selfish, indulgent, all these kinds of things. And there was some sort of um, at least some kind of. Um, um, moments of that being talked about, particularly at the beginning of the film, there was some pushback from Cooper, because Cooper was kind of all about, <clears throat> Cooper kind of in some ways represents the individual, and he was very much, you know, he wanted to sort of explore, he wanted to take risks, he wanted to sort of, you know, he he wasn't interested in just farming and stuff, I mean, it was kind of his whole thing of, with his son, well, he wasn't really satisfied that his son would just be a farmer, so he kind of he kind of had some pushback from that. But there was that kind of sense I got. Of course, it's difficult. They don't explicitly say the blight is kind of global warming, but it's sort of it was too too easy. I think too difficult not to see it. You know, not to see that parallel. I don't know. Did anyone else sort of see that parallel? Or was was that perhaps my thoughts? But I mean, it seems to me fairly obvious. But yeah, I saw that, and uh, there was that one part where they were talking about how uh, the world no longer needed engineers, and um, I think right. th that that part was just like, what? Like, if that was the case, then you know the the price of an engineer would just go down, and the price of farmers would go up, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you right. you have to understand that this is a Hollywood movie, and um, usually. Uh, People that uh, are interested in art have very little idea of how the free market works, and I, I also thought that was uh, pretty pretty um, unrealistic because you know to farm you need machines, and to have machines you need engineers, yeah. and uh, to produce food you need so many other what things. It's not. Didn't they need Cooper to fix a machine in half half? Exactly, time? exactly. So uh, <laughs> this is the the socialist slash liberal view of uh, not understanding how the intricacy of free mar of the free market uh, works and uh, the division of labor and uh, all the parts that are at play. You know, like we're running out of food. Okay, we only produce food, and there's nothing else out there for. There's there are no other jobs, just farmers. But there are so many other things that. Um, uh, the farmer depends upon when when he produces food, and uh, you know, I mean, who produces the plates? Who pr that, that they eat from? Who makes uh, the furniture? Who uh, it, it, it life does not stop at food. So yeah, yeah, I see, so, I see your point. That's a very interesting observation, Addy, because one of the things I hear all the time being out here is is that you know people. People in the cities don't appreciate what the things that the farmers do to make their life in the cities possible, and yet it's it's exactly the same the other way around. Because if it wasn't for the people in the cities that produce the machinery and the mechanics and all the intricacies of that, the farmers would be out there, you know, scraping an existence in a very difficult way that wouldn't leave them anywhere near as productive as they currently are. Yeah, there will be no machines, no pesticide, no communication. I mean, uh, f think about the phone lines and and uh, uh, no no transportation for them to reach uh, uh, the stores and buy the products that they need. And uh, yeah, it's um, it's it's a well, whole intricate world. 
<laughs> the pesticides are <laughs> kind of an aside because that that is something that one could argue easily could be one of the reasons that the farmers are not doing as well as they are because we're ruining things with the pesticides, overuse of the pesticides. Well, overuse, but there are pesticides and pesticides. You know, it's uh, putting them all in one category. I think it's a, it's a mistake. And uh, plus, you know, I mean, who would they sell their products to if not to the people in the city? Like, uh, that's their uh, uh, market. I mean, that's where they sell their yeah. product and uh, hating on your own customers. It's not a uh, very productive or a very good idea. Yes, yeah. it's it's it, it just highlights what you were saying. I agree with you 100%. It's it's a it's a totally warped perspective on on the interrelationships of different groups of people. Mm, yeah, interesting. Well, I think we kind of um <clears throat> kind of given it a good once over. I know that AD, you wanted to sort of come up with some conclu conclusions perhaps before we end the show. Um, but I, I wanted to be able to offer people any opportunity in now if they wanted to sort of chime in and with some interesting part that we perhaps missed and um, and um, yeah, go for it if you want. Um, otherwise, I'll I'll let Ad conclude the show. So uh, yeah, I I just uh, had a few thoughts that I wanted to share with you at the end of this uh, uh, hangout uh, thoughts that I had before we started the call and then I started to shape more and more during the conversation. So um, about Interstellar, you know, uh, if you take this movie, as Philip said, as a dream movie or maybe even a DMT or LSD trip, then um, you will have a good time enjoying the experience that uh, it will create for you. However, if, uh, however, I think the movie lacks uh, in content, plot and dialogue and personally I, I find myself bothered by the length the length at which uh, Hollywood seems to often go to justify the absence of parental guidance and love. Way too many stories that end up on our screens are simply an intricate and complex justification of parental neglect. So it seems to me that the main thing that fuels Hollywood's creativity is the, how to call it, uh, the excuse-making machine of parental abandonment. I know that the artists behind these creations, like you know, many of us, are consciously or subconsciously dealing with their own childhood issues, which end up, uh, in the end, transpiring through their work. But every now and then, you know, it would be nice to see some of these artists confront these problems head-on, instead of investing millions of dollars and years of their lives trying to bring to the big screen the most implausible excuses for their parents' mistakes. So that's all the time we have for now, guys. Um, thank you for joining. We'll be back next week with the Afterthoughts podcast in which we'll bring to light more interesting facts and themes of this trippy, trippy movie. Stay tuned to our Google Plus yeah. page, to our Facebook group, or in the FDR forums for more information about this. And... Uh, have a wonderful Saturday, and thank you for a very enjoyable conversation. Yeah, thank you, AD. Um, I just had one, there was one audience member, Johannes, who's just thrown a question out, and I, I think it's kind of a light one, and it's fairly, you know, it's sort of related a little bit, and we can end with this particular Oh, indeed, we have a question. Yeah, I, I, Johannes Thies and I, I, I don't know Johannes personally, but um, I'm guessing he's from Europe with that name. Props from Norway, but anyway, I'm guessing here, so sorry, Janis, if I got that wrong. Um, anyway, his question is, a question in the, to those of you that have seen um, 2001 Space Odyssey, um, what comes to your mind comparing the two movies? Some possible points of comparison, the portrayal of artificial intelligence, intelligences, the, um, the movie makers being comfortable with leaving the audience. Now, that last bit, I kind of get some of that the relationship that I have with 2001 and this movie, um, I don't know, it's it's interesting because people compared this with Gravity a lot of uh, 2001, but um, but the comparisons here, I guess the silence in, uh, and this is just my visceral memory of, of, um, of um, 2001, was the silence. And the silence is translated in in um, in um, Interstellar by time dilation. 
and I think that's that's uh, that's some of the relationship perhaps that I would see with it. But that's me being my artistic uh, self, using using metaphors in that way. But um, I don't know. Does that, does anyone else see any kind of relationship with two thousand and one in this movie? Briefly, quickly, you know. One thing that comes to mind is the soundtrack. I mean, the very beginning of 2001, right. pretty pretty uh, amazing soundtrack. You know, I didn't really pay as much attention to the soundtrack of Interstellar as obviously Philip and a number of others have. So I, I'm, I'm just, I'm actually, I did pay much more attention to the one in 2001, however. So that's the, the contrast I would give you all. Yeah, fair enough. No, I agree. I agree. Okay, well guys, thanks very much for joining and callers particularly and any audience members out there that have been listening, um, really, really, yeah, enjoyed this, um, it gave me some clarity about the movie, maybe not um, the most interesting as such, but I'll think on later this week and we'll have an afterthought session, me and Aidy, um, in the next week, we'll, we would like to join. We'd like a caller to join us, of course. If there are callers out there or callers in the call, of course, that would really like to join us with this, um, we'd be happy to hear you out and um, you know talk to you about it. Um, the next movie after the Afterthoughts, the next movie we've decided in February will be The Matrix. <laughs> it's been people have really, really asked for this movie, so and I do think it's probably a good movie to to uh, discuss. I think it's got a lot of metaphors, um, a lot of philosophy as well in it actually, even almost direct philosophy as well, almost quoting philosophers verbatim in the movie. So um, that's going to be our next movie in February. But um, but listen, many thanks and hope you have a great day, a great evening, what's left of it for us in Europe and uh, for you in uh, the US. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now.